This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey babies, this is Lar Park Lincoln, Tina from Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood. And you're listening to Tommy Throwback Kovac on Splat from the Past. Hey Bad News Crews, Tommy has a joke for you. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming Troy Elke. Troy is a horror fan, particularly of the Friday the 13th movies. And uh, like me, he's a contributor to 13 Fanboy, and he is a frequent guest on Greg Gilbert's Python's Paradise, and I'm having him on the show today. He's a funny, funny guy, a real hoot. He's a contributor of many indie horror films and a producer on a lot of them, you know, after contributing to them and, and so forth. And it's going to be a great conversation today. It's going to be a wild ride. I mean, Troy Elke, I call him the man, the myth, the legend. And it's going to be a great talk today. Uh, yeah, Greg Gilbert helped me make this talk happen. And I thank you, Greg. Also, rest in peace, Cindy Morgan, an early splat guest and an early movie crush for most of us boys out there, Lacey Underall in Caddyshack, Dr. Laura Baines in Tron, Gloria Marlowe in, on Bring Him Back Alive, Vicki Jensen in The Midnight Hour, etc. She was one of my earliest interviews on Splat from the Past on October 13th, 2017, she was sweet, complicated, suffered no fools gladly, and was an en engaging delight. I regret not doing a follow-up interview with her. You can go listen to it under Classic Splat on YouTube. I had to take the old upload down and re-upload it. Then, it's just, it's so sad. I never got to meet her in person either. Rest in peace, Cindy. Thanks for the time. I wish we could have met, and I wish God could bring you back alive. See so, ya! Yeah, here is my interview with Troy Elke. Hello, hello. Hey, Troy, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm doing well about yourself. I am fucking fantastic. Thank you so much for taking the time today, man. I appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, yeah, I've, I've known about you from um, Greg Gilbert's show, you know, going on there multiple times and stuff, and you make me laugh every day on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> let's let's get into your background. Like, where are you from originally? Uh, I was born in Portland, Oregon, actually, on Krampus Night, 1969. Nice. Nice. Yeah, my dad uh, lives in Marysville, Washington. He's been there 11 years now. And my my, uh -huh. grand, my grandmother moved there in 1978. Wow. And you used yeah, to... I Go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, he's, he's uh, probably used to the Northwest weather by now. Yeah, I've only been out there twice in my whole life. I went there for a wedding when I was 10, and then I went there to visit my dad about eight years ago. And we've been trying to make it happen to, to, to go back, but of course COVID hit and all that shit. Yeah, yeah, that made everything quite difficult. Yeah, fucked up everybody's plans. Sure did. And uh, you used to do construction? Uh, yeah, I spent uh, a lot of time doing Finnish carpentry, you know, uh, staircase, staircases, courtrooms, uh, that kind of thing. Wow. So did you ever uh, get like a, a, a nail through your hand or something? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was actually, uh, I was, we went to, to do a house for this guy. It was a custom job on the side and he uh, bought pallets he bought pallets you know i'm talking wood pallets that stuff comes on and he pulled all the boards off them and he wanted to go for some kind of a rustic look or some i don't know what the hell but yeah. anyway <laughs> and so i i had to nail you know four inch or four foot sections all the way across this thing and i was uh nailing together you know a joint mm -hmm. uh where, I, where you splice them together and in holding the pieces together uh, the finish nail went through. It's a two-inch nail that went through, and it just absolutely curled back out and went in between the joint of my thumb and right out through the other side. Oh, my God. And, uh, 
Yeah, it was a surprise. I, I had a couple of close calls, but other than that, yeah, I still got all my digits. Yeah, I remember being a kid, walking barefoot in my backyard and getting a nail through my big toe, but mm -hmm. not deep enough to cause any damage, but it hurt like a bitch, and I'm glad I don't have a scar or anything from that. Yeah, it's it's dangerous. You got to look out for those. Yeah, you, you never forget stepping on a good nail. No, <laughs> never. <laughs> what, what, what do you do these days when you're not doing horror stuff? Uh, actually, I sell... E-bikes. Nice, nice. Then, yeah, so uh, I, I get to I get to ride on them. You know, I build them, I ride them, I work on them. Uh, sell a lot of them. Is that is that a lot less stressful job to do? Yeah, it, it physically for sure. I mean, I I couldn't imagine. I mean, I used to throw like a, an entry door, an exterior door with the frame and everything over my shoulder and hike it up three flights of stairs to put it on the little balcony, you know, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And nowadays I'd be like, no, no. And, uh, you know, <laughs> so now I'm just, I'm, I'm assembling bikes and, you know, it's, it's, it's way less, uh, I'm in sales, man. That's where I'm in sales now from, from heavy duty construction into sales now. So that's, uh, I, I like it a lot. Uh, you know, I get to talk to people. It's a lot less physically strenuous on me. Interesting, interesting. So, going back in time, what was the first horror movie that had an impact on you? Oh, it's easy. I, um, I mean, growing up, honestly, I was always a monster movie kid. You know, you had Sunday, every Sunday you had the monster movie matinee, so you had Godzilla. Of course, we had all the universal monsters. Right. And, um... All that kind of thing. So I always grew up on everything spooky, everything haunted house. Well, that all kind of changed or, or took the, the jump to the next tier uh, in 1978, actually. Uh, movies were real big in our family. So like my mom and I, we yeah. were, you know, that was kind of our thing. And so she would let me stay up to watch Siskel and Ebert. And mm -hmm. they, Siskel and Ebert played, and I believe it's still on YouTube right now. It was the last time I looked it up. But they, on their show, played like 10 minutes of Halloween. And it was the scene where Jamie Lee Curtis got chased into the closet and he crashed right. his way in and then she used the coat hanger and all that. And then, you know, uh, where she, she comes out and stands in the doorway. And then he sits up behind her. And I mean, I almost shit a cat right there. Just, <laughs> oh my God. And I just... I fell in love. That it scared the shit out of me. I was not expecting that because, you know, you'd expect that from Frankenstein or from you know. But this was I don't know. It was just a different different animal. So, uh, it scared a smile onto my face. I mean, I was like, oh my god, that scared the crap out of me. I love it. And then from there, I had a couple of friends that ended up, and I I, I just don't remember. It was it was uh, early. 80s and they had Friday the 13th part 1 and 2. I do not remember whether it was on like VHS, video disc or perhaps it was because I remember a couple of the neighbors I knew had uh, HBO and that was you know, whoa, you got, yeah. the, you got cable? And in any case, I had watched those two over at my friend's house and that's where I got my absolute love for the Friday the 13th series. So I tried to go see Creep Show with a friend of mine and they wouldn't let us in because uh, if you if you went dressed up, you got in for a discount or whatever. We went, we were too young, so they wouldn't let us in there. And uh, so Friday the Thirteenth Part Three came along, and I begged my uncle, I'm like, you have got to take me to see this, and he did. And when I went and saw it, it was uh, it, not red and blue glasses; these were just clear. It was the I forget the name of it. It's the true true 3D, and it was so phenomenal i remember scrunching down in my seat in that scene in the barn when she hits him in the head with the axe and he's reaching out coming out or you know yeah. his hands were coming out of the screen you know and i'm i knew it wasn't real but i was still kind of scrunching down because it was you know i was like this is a little uncomfortable but uh oh yeah no that was that was it man that was it for me it was off yeah, I, I, movies were big in my family too but uh, my parents didn't like horror and yet they had me watching The Shining when I was a year old because they loved Jack Nicholson. <laughs> so uh, that fucked me up for about six years. Then I watched it again, and I have loved it ever since. Um, did you did you call your Kool Aid Red Rum? Did I what? <laughs> <laughs> like when you had Kool Aid as a kid, did you call it Red Rum? Red Rum, no. 
<laughs> I should have. I should have. Yeah, no, but uh, yeah, that was my introduction to horror. And then I was watching all the horror comedies like Ghostbusters and Gremlins. And yes. then um, I started getting into slasher films when I was eight. But um, yeah, I mean, you grew up in the 70s, so did you have like a local horror host on TV? Um, actually, that's funny because uh, we I got introduced to some low budget uh, like cable show host lady whom I just adored and my mom sent away and bought uh, bought me a shirt off of her TV show in the 70s and it just showed her mm. her vulnerable cleavage and her lovely long black hair and it was Elvira <laughs> uh, that yeah. was uh, yeah that was kind of my first and I, I loved her character what Cassandra did with that character because she was such a smart ass mm. and I think that's that's what really <laughs> That's what really I think made Elvira for me the best ever. I mean, you know, later growing up, I had my uh, you know everybody had your Joe Bob Briggs and that kind of thing. But yeah, um, no, she was most definitely the one for me. I didn't have the, uh, uh, you know, I know there's a couple of really famous like hosts out of you know whatever Chicago or New York areas and these kind of things. Yeah. But um, what we got when we got it was uh, finally Elvira. Yeah, by the time I, I was of coming of age, th there was no more local horror host. There was there was Rod Shear and Gilbert Gottfried on USA Up All Night, and Joe Briggs, mm -hmm. Joe Bob Briggs. Um, I didn't see him during the uh, movie channel years. I only saw him on TNT Monster Vision because uh, that channel was too expensive. And my mom works for the cable company. It was too expensive. Yeah, and, <laughs> like... Before I was born, uh, we had a local horror host in the Bay Area named Bob Wilkins, who later left and, and John Stanley took over, and I've had John on the podcast twice. Uh, his, la his last year, I was a year old uh, when he was on, and that was about it. You know, th there was no yeah. local people. Uh, there was only national. Right. And now, it's at the point now where being a horror host has become somewhat of a social media influence, and it's unfortunate in a lot of ways. You know, because they want to do it. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was weird, you know. Like it, it's well, a lot of things are kind of that way now, and uh, where everyone has access to it, you know, so you can host your own shows. And back then, you you really had to be the one, yeah. kind of. You know what I mean? It was a lot harder. Like music, I think. You know, too. You have you have people now. Not to say that the musicians were innovative back then, but. You know, you had to be recognized by someone, and you basically had to get the backing of someone right. to become big back then. Now you have artists that have access to you know getting their content out there, and now if they're good, people are seeing it, and they're making all this money without having to jump through a lot of the older hoops that you know yeah. those people. And then on the other hand, uh, the, the people that are ripping you off on your record deals are also getting exposed more, so it's probably harder for them to just kind of rip you off at the same time. Yeah, I mean, I, there's a there's a horror host I'm friends with uh, named Miss Misery in the Bay Area. She's great. I mean, she's a self starter. She writes one or two books a year. She does a million different things. You know, I mean, she's she's great. But like, yeah, I mean, it's it's somewhat uh, unfortunate now that uh, they have to rely on the internet to to become a horror host because there's just no, you know, other t TV platforms. Not very many left. You know, it's it's really sad. Right. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, was the first Friday the Thirteenth the one that uh, you fell in love with? Is that the first one you saw? Well, I did see it. the first one. I saw. I saw one and two at my friends uh, back to back. Whatever. I don't know if they had HBO or, like I said, you know, VHS. I don't remember how they had them, but they had them. Yeah. And so we watched both of those, and then uh, yeah, I loved them. And then I went and saw Part Three in the theater. Now, since I went and saw Part Three in the theater. I have gone and seen every single Friday the 13th on opening night since. Wow. I've, I have never seen a Jason movie in the theater. It's just, I I didn't have good timing. I almost went to see Freddy vs. Jason in the theater, but I didn't. Um, but I only go, almost, almost, not completely, but almost primarily, I only go to see horror and I don't let a Jason movie pass me by. If they make the next one, even I, I don't care who it is or what it is. I'm going to see it. Um, you know, I just horror for me. There's something about it on the big screen that just makes it so much more fun. And especially Jason, because yeah. 
Jason, when he kind of when he kind of made the turn to a little more campier, a little more fun, um, you know, that really I I think kind of played into the theater experience. It just made it more, you know, like oh, yeah. in six when they kind of there, there's parts where they acknowledge. In fact, it's the uh, the old grave digger that's you know that says uh, his famous line. Whatever, some people got a strange idea of entertainment or whatever. Mm-hmm. He's looking he's looking right into the into the audience, you know what I yeah. mean, into the camera. And so they uh, they break that barrier there and it just you know, and I, I kinda love the evolution of it really. I mean if you think about it, it was a very part one was, you know, people yeah, it's a slasher flick, but it was, it was a woman. It was the the guy's mom. It was you know, it was yeah. a, for the time of all these slasher flicks coming out, this one kinda had, you know, a, a good uh, a good base story and then to take that killer and have her killed and then add the the legend to it you know i i don't know if you ever talked to greg about my uh my i i spent a lot of time and i put together if you were to sit down and watch friday the 13th one through you know all of them Uh and disregarded every book or every story you'd ever heard outside of the movies and you will notice there are several, uh, you know, continuity problems yeah. and such, including makeups. Well, I, I spent a lot of time, man, and I put together. I'm about ready to write it into a book, but I, I, I fixed it. Yeah, I made all. I made, I made sense out of all of it. And I'll tell you one thing: is uh, I made Elias the sack-headed killer. And little Jason, who he had rescued from the lake and had been raising in that hut, uh, just followed him around and watched what he did. And then uh, that made him uh, remember that attack on Chris Higgins when he didn't kill her and all that. And he yeah. was wearing different clothes than he was the next. Uh, that was his first kind of uh, attempt at uh, doing something. I don't know. There's a lot to it. but Wow. Yeah, yeah I, was, I was eight when I started watching them because... Uh, I, I I knew about the movies because I'd see the, uh, the the VHSs on the shelf at the video store with the hockey mask and everything, and mm-hmm. the first one to this day is still my favorite slasher movie of all time. But when I was eight, I, I loved it, but but I was dumbfounded by the fact that uh, Jason wasn't the killer in it because I remember going, "Wait a minute, doesn't doesn't the guy with the hockey mask kill them all?" <laughs> you know, right? And, and so like. VH, so like HBO, Cinemax, and USA Network played them nonstop in the early '90s, and I it just, it just started to grow on me, you know. And Jason's always been my guy, you know. I've never I, I like Michael Myers, but not as much, you know. And I was a Freddy guy before uh, Jason, actually. But um, yeah, Jason has always been my guy. I, I, out of yeah. all the out of all the movies in the series, which ones are your favorites? Oh, if I had to break them down, I, okay, well, f- without question, my number one is three, because I saw it in a theater in 3D, mm-hmm. and I had a huge crush on Dana Kimmel at the time. She was uh, recurring on yeah. a lot of the, the sitcoms that I watched and stuff like that, and so and it was just kind of the perfect storm for me, because uh, I had seen the other two at home in the living room. This was my first Jason in the theater. It, it, uh, it happened to be where he got his mask. It had uh, 3D. I mean, there was just so much to it. And then from there, <clears throat> I, I think I would probably jump to six. Yeah. Um, six and seven I really like, but it's hard to jump past one because one's really, it's a, spectac- a spectacular movie. It was so well done. I mean, and then they pulled in... Uh, Betsy Palmer into there, you know. Um, uh, it's, it's tough. It's tough because, it, you know, it, it kind of depends, I guess. You know, if I want to watch it Friday the 13th, yeah, and there's a lot to choose from, I think I'll watch one depending more on my mood. You know, if I want to watch more of a, a truly kind of a scary one, definitely one. Um, two, you know, three had some, and it started to have a little bit of fun with it. Four was a little more fun, and then it just kind of started to get, you know, more and more campy and fun after that. Yeah. Uh, my least my least favorite would be uh, between nine and ten. Same here. Uh, I just, I, I'm not a fan of going to space. Now, I at first, you know, was not a big fan of nine, and mostly because uh, no Jason. But I loved portions of this movie where they blew him up in the beginning, and they finally SWAT teamed him down. And all this. there was a lot of cool stuff in there. You had the first uh, Freddy glove appear and pull down the mask at the end, and then to find out from Adam Marcus that he was 
he was absolutely, you know, a hog tied on that. And they said, okay, well, you know, you can do the thing, but the one thing we don't want is the mask. We don't want the mask in this movie. And it's like, oh. So he didn't just come in there and say, all right, I'm going to make this without, you know. And so he, he had his hands kind of tied a little bit, but he, uh, you know, like I said, it was hit and miss. I think the biggest thing I didn't like about it was just the fact that he was body jumping and whatever. And I just, you know, I wanted my hockey mask guy. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you kind of add that into the overall body work, a lot of people hate five. I, I actually like five. I think it's a lot of fun. And mm-hmm. I think it was kind I think it was a kind of a cool idea that in the middle of this franchise, of course, they didn't know they were going to have like, you know, this many, I'm sure at the time, but to throw in that, uh, throw that wrench in the system and just kind of like it was the imposter movie you know and um who else has done that i mean there wasn't an imposter michael or freddie or or uh, i'm trying to think if there was anybody else that's uh, ever had one of their movies in their franchise where it wasn't well it's a single killer well it's funny because halloween 3 didn't have michael myers at all so i think oh yeah so I think that that you know that wind fog was the imposter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's a good that's a good point. I actually love that movie too. I absolutely love it. Yeah, and it was funny because the first time I saw it, I was just like everybody else. What? Uh, where's Michael? You know, I come yeah. to find out later that they were just they were going to do a whole anthology of them, and they liked Michael from the first one, the Boogeyman one, that they made him a second one, and then they went to move on, and everybody's like, no. Well, they went back. Yeah. But, uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge Carpenter fan. Anything he has, I'll pretty much. Uh, yeah, I, I, I love them all. I, uh, I mean, I love them all. But one and six are my absolute favorites. You know, one because it was the first one for me, and six, <laughs> six used to play on our local UHF station every Halloween starting around 1991, and it lasted until Joe Bob started playing it on TNT. Um, I, I just I just love all the comedy in six. I think the actors are great. The kills are just as sadistic, and Tom Tom McLaughlin uh, brings so much humor to it. It's just it's a very memorable one. And I tell this story all the time. We used to have one of those VHS, uh, one of those VCRs that uh, would play sound um, over over something over a different channel, and uh, we were, we were taping something. And I saw this long after um, the uh, TV spot for for Jason Libs was playing, and uh, during the moment when the little girl is in the uh, bed and the door is rattling, there was this. I don't know what this was. I don't know what I actually. And I know I did this because I was a baby and I used to do this all the time. I recorded sound over it of like. I don't know, some creepy, eerie music noise. And I remember watching the tape and seeing that a bunch of times when I was a kid and just getting goosebumps and just being terrified. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny too, Six is, it's so much fun. Um, the beginning when they mm-hmm. reanimate Jason really, to me, had this universal monster feel to it. So oh, I, yeah. and I know, I know it's not really Tommy's, uh, you know, he's not in control of it, but I would like to see that movie in black and white mm. with a little film grain over the top. I think it would make a kick ass, almost, you know, like a universal, just six in black and white would be a cool, uh, like Blu ray, you know, bonus thing where you could watch that movie in black and white with maybe a little film grain over it. I think it'd be awesome. When I watch all of them, especially the first six, uh, I see that old Gulf Western Paramount logo. It just yes, it makes Chills. it so fantastic. Like it's a product of its time, and yep. it's it, it, there's nothing more intoxifying than it. It's just I love it. What, what are your favorite kills in the in the series? Um, well, I uh, I think my my favorite, and again this. You know, goes back to three, but Andy walking on his hands because yeah. you know, as a man, as a man, I think as a human being, you know, being, yeah. uh, having a machete slice you, uh, you know, between your legs would be a kind of a scary thought. I also really, really enjoyed uh, ten, the uh, frozen face smash. I thought it was pretty cool. Um, I really liked uh, some of the simpler, more brutal kills. The, uh, in fact, I was talking to Ted White's son the other day about nice. he was telling me a fan, fantastic story about the kill scene on uh, four in the shower where he gets his head crunched into the wall yeah and uh, he was telling me so his dad you know he was up there and they were 
uh, talking about how expensive this, I think it was a $12,000 prop or something like that. And how the guy was below, like holding the prop up. And he's the guy that like built this thing and everything. He's telling Ted, you know, do not, please do not, you know, we got to shoot this again. Do not screw this up. Don't fuck this thing up, man. It's a $12,000 thing. Yeah. And Ted White's like, oh yeah, oh yeah, buddy, I got you, no problem, you know. And so he sits in there and he starts just kind of crunching this thing. And the guy's like, dude, dude. After each cut, he's like, dude, no, 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 no. And then uh, they did it a few times, and then he said his dad was just like, all right. And then they did it, and he just, ah, just smashed yeah. it in the wall. <laughs> yeah. And it was pretty funny because he was like, you know, he was talking about his dad, and it was. It was a funny inside story because he was the guy was panicking, you know. He's like, "Dude, don't ruin this!" Don't, and he's like, getting increased. Oh, yeah. And the director was like, "Dude, just no. I need you to, I need you to be brutal, you know. I need you to smash this thing." And then the other guy's like, "Don't, don't, please, don't, don't smash this thing, man. Don't please, just be careful." And the other guy's like, "No, I need you to mash it." And so, yeah. <laughs> yeah the, in the final cut, he says you can even see like the jaw breaking off and everything. And uh, but yeah, that was uh, that was a pretty good kill as far as brutality. Uh, uh, Rick just getting his uh, head crushed in, his eye popping out, although you could see the string and it flying out and all that. Um, mm-hmm. I, 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 um, I see. I love uh, when uh, when Deborah Voorhees boyfriend, uh, uh, you know, gets the stick in the barbed oh, wire strap. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. that's great. I love it. <laughs> yeah, that's what one of those real brutal ones again. She told me, she said, she said, it wasn't as bloody as I'd like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the dude with the road flare in the mouth, I love. Uh, yeah. Ch- Chuck yeah. getting electrocuted in part three. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 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 gee, well, I can't think it was in Julius. No, getting his head punched off. That was pretty funny. Uh, which one? I like that, that one. Almost. Uh, in uh, uh, Manhattan when they're boxing on top oh. of the roof and he punch, punches his head off. Right. Right, I forgot about that one. Yeah, I actually really liked uh, Annie in the beginning of one. That that neck slice and and peel open was oh, yeah. so well done by Savini. It was that that was that was real looking. Oh my god, the arrow through Kevin Bacon is without question the greatest kill yeah. in my opinion in Friday the Thirteenth history. If you want to go like realistic and creepy you know i mean there's a lot of fun ones like i said rick getting his head you know crushed in and his eye popping out but yeah i'm definitely going with kevin bacon on that one yeah they tried to redo it in part three <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah my god um uh, who's your favorite jason Ooh, that's kind of a tough one um i was friends with uh richard brooker and mm-hmm. we used to talk a lot and he, I was actually talking to him the night that he died, and he said he wasn't feeling well. I'm like, oh, I'll go get some rest, you know, or whatever. And then he posted one more thing in the thread, and then uh, he went on and he was having a heart attack or something. And uh, I always liked him. Part three again, and he was such an amazing person. And, you know, he just, he would, he would take a picture of the sunset every single night. And for some reason, and he was in uh, in Florida, I think, or uh, or no, it was California, whatever. Yeah. Uh, in any case, um, I I got almost kind of used to you know looking for that, and uh, you know it, it, I don't know. It was just I thought it was so neat that Big Bad Jason Voorhees is uh, sharing these sunsets every night, and they were just spectacular, you know. And then you mm-hmm. start kind of catching the beauty of it. It's like wow, that is actually really neat. And then. Started looking forward to his uh, his posts and uh, and uh, you know and then of course uh, unfortunately he passed away and uh, I was also friends with Steve Dash talked to him on he was the first I met him when I when I got on uh, when I got on Facebook and uh, you know it started kind of friending people that I'd seen in movies he was the first one that commented on something of mine that I made him laugh and it was. Uh, it was uh, something I saw. I think it was like on the Ellen show or something, whatever. It was just a joke I saw. And it was like, oh, man, I woke up this morning and, you know, really hot to the touch, very dizzy. And, and uh, it turns out I fell asleep in the dryer. And he he got on there and just laughed. He, you know, he was, ah, was hilarious or whatever. And then uh, I'll never forget that because it was like, wow, this, you know, this Jason guy just said something about, you know, whatever. And, uh, yeah, yeah and then, you know, we'd end up chatting quite a bit after that. But, uh so yeah, I mean, there's it's hard to choose because Kane Kane 
in the campier, funner versions, I think, with the way he portrayed his body language was amazing. CJ yeah. was in phenomenal in six. Ted White, he was like, he was a meaner, scarier one, I think. That's Greg's um, favorite, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I do think Ted White was one of the scarier Jays. He just kind of, I don't know what it was about him. He was no nonsense. And, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's probably... Uh, that's probably it. I used to have a, I used to have a page on Facebook before they so graciously took my original profile. Uh, uh, the the many faces of Jason Voorhees, and I just I listed every single person that even did like a, a, you know a hand stand in or anything you know that, that ever played Jason, and uh, including the uh, the woman from Part Two. But. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Always been my favorite franchise. Always will be. Yeah, I mean they're I mean all the Jasons are great. Kane and CJ are like my two favorite. Um yeah, Ted, I I mean he was exceptional and I, I was probably the last person to interview him um back in twenty nineteen. He was scheduled to be my two year anniversary guest and he had to reschedule and then uh we didn't do it until September. This was May, so we didn't do it till September. And by that point, you could tell that he was going downhill. He didn't remember a lot of stuff, and he didn't have his mm -hmm. wife with him. But I'm glad, you know, I got to talk to him, you know, for that roughly an hour. And um, I went on his website, got an autograph. That was the smartest thing I ever did because I knew I wasn't going to meet him at a convention. I remember the first time I figured. Have you uh, have you ever seen Starman? Of course. Okay, so you know Ted White's in that. Well, the first time. I put that together. Oh, and and in, in talking with you know he Ted White was not only a badass but he was awesome man. He was uh, you know like John Wayne's stunt man and shit. I mean this guy did some. Oh, I, yeah. His son was telling me all these stories and it is so cool to hear some of these stories. You know and I I could listen to these things all day. You know but uh, mm -hmm. yeah I'll never forget when I first saw him and I realized wait a minute. That is Jason. And then you look at him, and he's just this goddamn scary standing in a parking lot with a chew in his lip, <laughs> you <Yeah>. know, <laughs> and pissed off, you know, uh, as, as he is as Jason. But, yeah, no, he was, uh, yeah, I can see why they got him. He was a big, uh, big scary man. Yeah, have you read that new book, Sackhead? I have not. Yeah, uh, it was written by a guy. His name's Ron Gann. He went by R.G. Henning when he wrote the book. It's about the entire making of Part 2. And um, mm. I had him on last year. I, th I think he's working on a Part 3. I don't know um, uh, for, for sure. But uh, he talks about how, you know... Um, yeah, Warrington and and Steve Dash were the, the two Jasons in the movie. But they, right. had, they had to have the... Uh, I guess he was a production assistant, uh, kill Lauren in her scene. Mm. Something like that. Oh, uh, um, Lauren, Lauren, Lauren. Oh, Lauren oh, Marie the, Taylor. uh, yeah. with the knife, uh, where they slowly walked forward with the, with the butcher knife, right? Yeah. I wonder if that was, uh, cause Ellen Lutter in part two, uh, -huh. uh, was, I believe the feet of Jason, or it was the hands of Jason, and then Jerry Jerry Wallace was the prowler, which is I can't remember if that was inside or the feet, one or the uh, one or the other. They were yeah, flip it. Yeah, it was pretty neat. I love these. It's these little little interesting tidbits, details that uh, you know. I, I find that kind of stuff really interesting. Absolutely. <laughs> Who were your uh, crushes in the series? Oh, uh, my number one biggest crush it was Danny Kimmel, without question. Yeah, um, I really liked uh, <clears throat> Amy Steele, of course. Um, Lara Park Lincoln. Yeah. Um, just recently, again, now. No, when when Jason Takes Manhattan came out and everything, and, and, well, I just rewatched it again, and I didn't realize how cute that girl was. Yeah, <clears throat> but I think I think she just wasn't the typical whatever. I don't know that. I, I don't know. But at the time, I just said, like, "Man," but uh, yeah, Dana Kimmel, Amy, and uh, oh, there's just there's so damn many, really. But I mean, uh, if you go with three, three alone, 
you know, Vera was smoking. I mean, they were all, they were all good looking. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that could go on for a while. A A Adrian, the moment I saw her, I was like, wow, you know, and I, when I met her in person, I couldn't believe it. And I've had her on the podcast twice, uh, hopefully going to have her on a third this year. Um, Lauren Marie Taylor, um, Tracy, I wouldn't kick her out of bed. Um, Lar mm -hmm. Lar Park Lincoln, she's been on the podcast more than any Jason guest five times. Oh, wow. I'm going to shoot for a six this year. Um, Tiffany Paulson and Jason Takes Manhattan. Oh, my God, she was smoking. Um, I, I jerked off to Deborah's tits for years and years like so many. <laughs> <laughs> And I and, and she knows it. I've told her. She just giggles. You know, she's got yeah, that. Yeah, there's she's probably got that. a lot of a lot of kids out there that, and then being on video, you know, that, that, there'll be a lot more at some point. She's got that Betty Rubble giggle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been so fucking lucky to meet people from the series and interviewed them. It's just it's so surreal to me. The first person I interviewed from the series was Carrie Noonan. Carrie Noonan. Which one did she play? She's the girl who dies for no reason in part six. The redhead. Uh, in the, in the, uh, no, wait, wait. I'm trying to remember. Wh which scene? I mean, what? where... Uh, oh, God, what was her name? She was the very nice uh, camp counselor who's uh, showing concern for the little girl and stuff. Oh, yeah, and yeah, She looks yeah, out the yeah. window. Uh, the, she, yeah. She's friends with Sissy? Yes. 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 She was absolutely doing no drugs, having no sex, and it was just a very kind person. Yeah, it was unnecessary. It was unmotivated. Yeah. And she was. Yeah, I, I interviewed her. She was the first one. She was so sweet to me. I like her a lot. Um, yeah, my no. my Judy Ernst no, okay. interview caused a lot of controversy because. <laughs> She claimed that she didn't have hypothermia and said nice things about Joe Zito when it's always been the contrary. <laughs> yeah, I, I've, uh, you know, I obviously wasn't there, but I've heard even, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that Ted White had said something. Yeah. Uh, during those, during, or, uh, yeah, wasn't it during that scene where he said, look, she's, free, you know, freezing or something like that? I right. Can't Right. It was, oh, and then you got you got Chris. Okay, your uh, your vote for best uh, dancer in the series. My vote for the best dancer, hands down, Tiffany Helm. Ah, uh, I'm gonna go with Crispin Glover. Okay, okay. <laughs> George <laughs> McFly. That it's okay. Dance? Jimmy Jimmy Deadfuck or whatever is his terrible dance he was down there doing. Yep, he'll oh, always be George McFly to me though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Ron Milky, I had him on. I feel bad for him because he, he, he played a cop in just one fucking scene in the first one, and forever he's bombarded uh, by the fans because of it. <laughs> you know, Is that the motorcycle one? The motorcycle cop, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. What, what, do, you, what do you make of the, uh, the Cunningham-Miller controversy? You know, I don't... I'm not... 100% schooled on who exactly is what here and there, mm -hmm. but uh, if, from what I understand, if I'm, I'm not mistaken, that they can both make movies now, but one can't use the name Jason and the, uh, or something. Like, they could, can they still make a hockey mask the whole movie but can't say Jason? Or what is it uh, where they can use Friday the 13th and not Jason now? There's something weird going on with that, I think, where they kind of almost split the rights. I don't know. It, it, it's really weird, but I got to tell you, I, I personally support Victor's uh, the decision about not creating more content right now, and I'll tell you why. I mean, you, you know this because you see this on, on Facebook a lot. You know, there's a lot of toxic fandom on Facebook, and... They, they, they feel very entitled, and they think that, you know, yeah. the creators owe uh, owe them, you know, more sequels and right. so forth, right? So when he, delay, when he delays more content being made, I just love watching them squirm, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, devoted Absolutely. fans like us who are not toxic, it, it sucks for us, right? But I, I just, I support uh, uh, Victor's decision just based on that. And I'm sure something will come around, you know. Yeah, oh yeah, that, it's, uh, it's a cash cow waiting to happen. So, you know, and it, 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 I'm okay with them taking their time because I, I just hope that this, whatever they come out with is 
you know, worth the wait. Yeah. I, you know, there was, I was uh, hit and miss with the remake. Uh, there was so much, I, I mean, first of all, I love having it. And there was a lot I loved about it. I didn't like it. <laughs> I, it's the one thing that I could, well, I, I didn't like a lot of the characters, honestly, but I, it's for some reason I can watch just about any of the Friday the Thirteenth movies over and over again, but that one I just get. I just that's like the last one I put in for some reason. Yeah, I mean it, it's it can be so toxic. Like I stopped posting my horror interviews in the uh, the horror groups because there were so many mean assholes commenting horrible things and being just unnecessarily rude on there. You know, well, and yeah. like everybody's a critic. Yeah, trying to negate, you know, something somebody said and saying it's inaccurate and all that. So I just stopped doing it, you know, two, three years ago, and I have felt so much better, you know. I don't miss it because I get plenty of views on my YouTube channel with all the followers I have now that I don't fucking need them anymore. Right. Are you a Freddy guy, too? Yeah, I've always liked Freddy. I mean, I... Uh... Especially early on, I remember. I think Dream Warriors is my favorite. Yeah. The uh, I, I want to say one, maybe two movies after that, I kind of faded out. Uh, I, I saw the. I walked out of the New Nightmare in the theater, mm -hmm. but I, I was also with my girlfriend, who was like, oh, "This movie sucks. This movie sucks." And I did, of course, finish it later, and it was uh, a little better than. But it just. You know, that was kind of the imposter thing almost, I guess, that, that come to think of it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but it was also very clever. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, no, I, 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 and I'm, I am not a hater of the Jackie Earl Haley uh, yeah. version. <laughs> Kelly Link in the Bad News Bears movies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember when I first heard that, I'm like, well, he's going to come riding up on a motorcycle with a cigarette hanging out of his mouth and fucking flashy with his glove. Yeah. <clears throat> I, uh, yeah, I mean, Dream Warriors was the first one I saw, and, like, that movie fucked me up when I saw, uh, Philip get turned into a puppet. I mean, that was oh, yeah. scary to me at, at, at three, with at the three, tendons at and everything. Four. Yeah. At four years old, yeah. that fucked me up, man. And,. Yeah, and then from there, I became a, a Freddy guy, you know. And at that time, Robert England was doing a lot of promotion, going on talk shows as Freddy sometimes, and doing right. different things. And he made, he, I mean, Freddy was already likable as a killer in the movies, but he made him even more likable doing the talk show circuit and just being a celebrity at that time, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I just... I love I love the Freddy movies, but it's kind of been tainted uh, for me because I've gotten to know a lot of the uh, the Freddy people too, and just I feel like a lot of them don't give a fuck about the series. They're just doing it for the money when they go to conventions and shit. And it, oh, it's kind gotcha. of sad. Yeah, I mean gotcha. the Jason people at least they're they laugh they laugh the success off and they'll they'll, they'll give the the fans their time and just be so nice to them. I mean, yeah, they've had their share of stalkers just as much as the the Freddy people too. But the Freddy people, it's just I don't know. There's just this this airs of arrogance about them. I feel. You know, I, I, it's funny because I, I had never thought about it, but when uh, you mentioning that, it's like I almost I somehow I kind of see what you're saying. It's like. It seems like the people that were in the Friday the 13th franchise are more fun and open to the... Because there's such a big fandom, you know? And then, like, the, the Freddy people, I don't... Maybe it's because I'm not seeing them as much, but I, I just don't feel like they're all... You know, I mean, I see uh, uh, Heather Langenkamp, you know, she's always doing stuff. And, oh, yeah, she's but, great. There's not a lot of the other people. I just saw the uh, the kid who played Kid Cade. Uh, he's got something going on now. Oh, I think Ken he's trying Sagos. to put a movie together. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ken, but uh, Ken, that, no, I haven't really seen a lot. Ken is a very unique guy. First time I met him, I thought he was a dick. And then <laughs> I got to know him. You know, he's like a mixture of of black Southern pride and ADD. That's the best way to describe <laughs> Ken. <laughs> He is just okay. the most wonderful, charming guy when you get to know him. And I just, I love that guy a lot. And I, I donated to his uh, crowdfunding when he was trying to get that short film made. And he's been on the show. And it's funny, he never talks about his stand-up comedy, but he did it with me because he knew I did stand-up. So I thought that was so mm. cool. Right on. Yeah, 
Yeah, I liked his character a lot. I thought he had uh, he was kind of a na- had a natural kind of funniness to him, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Asshole. <laughs> the, way, the way he says that. Yeah. How about uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre? Uh, I do like them. Now, I am uh, the reverse on this, and I'm, I'm a fan of the newer ones more than I was the original. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think it's just because, like, the original, you know, is it's dark and it's twisted and whatever, and then later on, you know, I, I didn't see that one until well after I saw Jason's and all these other movies, and... Uh, you know, it was dark and twisted and gritty and gross and scary. and But it wasn't until later, I think, where they kind of made Leatherface more of a character. Mm-hmm. You know, kind of, I don't know. I, I enjoyed, like, later when he became, you know, it's, it's like if you watch season one of Married with Children. Yeah. Versus they just took, they took season one as pretty, their characters are relatively bland. Mm-hmm. And they just took everything that people liked about those characters in part two and amplified the shit out of them. And so I feel like they kind of do that same thing yeah. in those, you know, in the movies there. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I don't think that the original is as gory and scary as people make it out to be. Because I was 13 when I first saw it, and I was like, where's the blood and guts? Where's the gore? All, yeah. I, all I got yeah. was meat hooks. In a creepy family dinner scene, that was about it. Yeah, you have you have a lot more going on, I think, in your imagination in that movie than you do. But like Prom Night, I mean, I, when's the last time you watched Prom Night, Jamie Lee Curtis? This, this thing is probably uh, a year ago. <laughs> it's like a it's like a TV movie, man. There's like literally yeah. no blood, no gore. Um, and the last time I watched it, I'm like, wow, this this today would be PG or PG thirteen, maybe if, you know, worst case scenario, but. Uh, I, I remember still loving it back then. Of course, my <clears throat> my biggest crush throughout entire Hollywood history, horror history for sure, was Jamie Lee Curtis. Uh, when oh, I yeah. saw... She was a wet dream of mine, her, too. <laughs> I, yeah, I had this. That was like a major, major... Uh, my, like when I was turning 12, 13, 14, that was like my first celebrity crush. Yeah, I, it's funny. The director Paul Lynch, he's been on the show. You know, it's it's, it's no wonder he he started directing television because you know, Prom Night and a lot of his horror movies look like TV horror movies. And he, and I was already getting a weird energy from the guy, so I, I, I guess I'm lucky I didn't uh, tell him that. You know, <laughs> but there's this guy named Tim Harden. He lives next door to the actual house in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and he gives tours there all the time. And in 1998, he launched the very first Texas Chainsaw Massacre website, and it still runs to this day. Oh, wow. Yeah, ain't that crazy? Yeah, that, yeah. that'd be kind of cool. Like, uh, I saw, oh, I don't know, five, six years ago, maybe, the Friday the 13th Part 2 house for sale went up for $207,000. Wow. And I'm like, man, how cool would it be? Like the Amityville house, the Myers house, any of these houses to to move into one of these houses. Like, okay, where I live, my friend, just uh, an hour and a half from, if I, if I jump in my car right now and drive in an hour, or drive an hour and a half, I'm at the Goonies house. Yeah. And <clears throat> the people that own that house are pricks yeah they have, they have tens of thousands of people that will show up outside their house daily now i understand how annoying this would be but let me explain something to you mm-hmm. i can cure that i would put a gate on my fucking driveway and i would say 10 bucks come on in Ten thousand people times 10 bucks each a day i'm good with that you yeah. know just gotta make the most of it and i would do that whatever it is uh who oh shit uh, what is it? Somebody, some building from a horror movie. I just saw it. I don't remember what it was. Now you can go there and eat, or go there and stay, or they turn it into like a diner. Was it the gas station from some movie or something? Uh, I, don't I don't know. Remember. I don't know. Mm. But but yeah, like f- fucking. Uh, there's a there's a guy. Uh, Greg's had him on the show many times. He's a he's a. Um, a uh, 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 convention manager named Sean Clark. He has a uh, a show on YouTube called The Thing with Two Heads, and he goes to all 
like horror movie locations in LA or different places and like you know he documents you know what they look like now and stuff so like yeah can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you sorry I got the kids moving a bunch of crap out right now <laughs> um, did I read right you were um, in a Nicolas Cage movie Pig yeah, so how was that? <laughs> uh, that was actually pretty neat. I was uh, I do a lot of featured background work here in mm-hmm. the Portland area, and so they always put me in with the the main stars. You know, I don't I don't do the crowd scenes. Like, I, like if I was at a football game, I would be the guy at the railing behind the coach with the sign that says "Go Team," or mm-hmm. you know what I mean. I would be in the scene. And so with, with Pig, I got a call and asked, you know, would you like to be in a movie Pig? And I said sure. And <clears throat> usually when they they send the uh, the casting thing out. I I look it up, and there was nothing on this movie. I'm like, all right, whatever. And so I went, and then I uh, found myself out in the woods. And then uh, there was me and this other woman. She was also a featured background actor, extra playing uh, truffle hunters. And mm-hmm. so we're on this trail, and basically, like I'm cleaning stuff up from under the tree and she's down there you know i'm digging for the truffle and and i'm i'm setting the stuff across this trail Mm -hmm. well up behind us there's a scene in the movie where they have like this big blue tarp hung up and there it's like where people are getting paid for their truffles bringing in their bucket there's a line all these truffle and there's there's this mean lady that runs the thing you know Mm -hmm. and at some point he shows up there and he's like oh they took my pig and she's like what motherfucker goddamn (laughs) son of bitches and she she's screaming Uh, down the trail motherfucking goddamn it and me and this lady have to get out of her and Nicolas Cage's way as they walk down the trail well first of all uh, I was there and I didn't know anything about this movie yeah. and I get there and someone's like oh I heard this might be uh, might be uh, uh, produced by Nicolas Cage I'm like oh that's cool wow. and then uh, you know we were there for a while and there was a, a guy I assume it was an actor and uh, I mean, he was. He had blood down the side of his head and all that shit. And then, uh, right after after a little bit, he's he's gone. And I look over and I'm like, "Son of a bitch, that's Nicholas fucking Cage!" And then, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was I was devastated that it hit the editing room floor. I'm hoping maybe for some extended director's cut or something. But yeah, she went on this big spiel. You motherfuckers is yelling him, and you know you better listen to this guy. He's in charge here. Fucking whatever. And she's leaving him, and then. And when the, in the movie scene, she's like, ah, all those assholes. And then it just goes to the next scene. But I did, I was able to find myself in it. So the other kid that's in that was the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh-huh. guy from Hereditary. But there's a scene, uh, I think it might be right after that scene, but where the Hereditary kid's walking up into the woods, and you'll see a guy about, I don't know, 20 feet ahead of him cross through. And then beyond that, me bending down in the tree so I actually got picked up from the scene I kind of was in the very 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 background in and then the one that I was uh, with Nicolas Cage got cut mm-hmm. and I was in an awesome one uh, it's called Kill the Orange Faced Bear Oh, <laughs> and they, they, they did a pilot it's Damon Wayans Jr mm-hmm. and they did a pilot his girlfriend got attacked by a bear when she went to spray it with the bear mace. She accidentally sprayed it with the orange paint. And so the bears, uh, one is voiced by Sarah Silverman. One is voiced by, uh, I can't remember the, the lady's name. And then uh, the boy bear, I don't remember. But so you got two different things here. You got the POV from the bears. And then uh, you have Damon Wayans and his friend who is dating the twin of the girlfriend of his that just got killed. But anyway, they had the, the big bar scene where it's directly after the funeral, and he's telling everybody, "My God, I'm not eating my bear." Yeah, I am. I am on the stool right next to him, and they actually hand me a beer to start the scene, and I drink it. And the whole time I'm standing, there, I'm sitting right next to Dave Williams Jr. as he's, you know, explaining what happened to his girlfriend. <laughs> and this was a lot of fun, and so I'm like, "Oh, this is going to be, you know, this is fantastic screen time." And they sold it to Comedy Central, mm-hmm. and they sold it to TBS, and then it got the X. Wow. So uh, I'm like, you know, it's got to go somewhere, right? Yeah. <laughs> somewhere, right? 
I mean, you think with all the streaming platforms, but the idea itself is going to either be hilarious or incredibly stupid. But, yeah, so I'm hoping that it, at some point this will still make it out, but... Eh. I did work on Metal Lords uh, for Netflix. I did work on Trinkets. Yeah. Stumptown with uh, Kobe Smolders. Yeah. It's, 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 it's funny, though. Nicolas Cage, I mean, he's today's his birthday, by the way. He turned 60. Oh, yeah, I did see that, yes. Yeah. I, I love Nicolas Cage, yeah. He's cool. Yeah, funny thing is, right, I mean, the guy has always been eccentric, and he's always done eccentric rules, but I, lately he's done really eccentric shit, almost like, almost close to, like, Marlon Brando in his, like, later years uh, kind right. of thing. Um, I'm friends with uh, the creature and makeup artist Ken Hall and his wife Amanda, who's a still photographer, and they worked with him on a low-budget horror movie movie about a, about two years ago or something uh, i can't remember the name of it and i don't know if it's released but i'm like really i mean man this guy must really hate hollywood now <laughs> if he's not doing <laughs> if he's not doing the huge blockbusters anymore well i think i i think and i could be a hundred percent wrong here i did not know so but i i just i thought that i understood it as because i always wondered why in the hell is this guy doing like it seemed like he would do anything and yeah I, I, I was told by someone that he owed a bunch of taxes. And just said, uh, they just just did work, pay, 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 done. And then it seems like maybe he paid that, and now he's moving back into more. I let, did you see the movie with him and uh, the Mandalorian guy? I forget his uh, his name off the top of my head. Uh, I heard about it, yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so good. He Someone hires Nicholas Cage to come out to his island because he wants Nicholas Cage out there, and there's Nicholas Cage playing Nicholas Cage, and he gets out there, and the guy like owns the guns from the Nicholas Cage movies and all this shit. It's really, it's awesome. It's just like some billionaire goofball that is just uh, loves Nicholas Cage, invites him out to the island and shit. It's 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 crazy. I really enjoyed it. I'll check it out. Yeah, I've I've, I've been an extra in a, in a bunch of things um, when I was in the Bay Area and stuff. I was in music videos and. Um, oh, right on. I was in I was in some music videos and I and I did uh, uh, extra work here and there. The other thing I don't like, man, is that you know extra work has become unionized now, and they don't realize mm-hmm. a lot of extras are mentally unstable, and right. if you if you uh, unionize it, it gives them so much entitlement. <laughs> I. I uh, uh. I wanted to do a 55th anniversary interview for Bullet, um, the Steve McQueen movie, last year. And I found this guy, I won't say his name, but he's been an extra in in many, many movies that were shot in the Bay Area. And Bullet was one of them. And he, 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 he looked a little narcissistic and weird in his picture. And then when I um, DM'd him, turns out I was right. Oh man, he said he, he wanted like a a, a five hundred dollar fee or something like that, and I was just oh, like, geez. "You are you are a fucking joke, man." <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, yeah. that's always sad too. You know, it's like they they say, "What is it? Don't, don't meet your heroes." Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, was, I used to live next to Popeye. Oh, he's not a hero of mine, but like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I, I had a neighbor, man, when I was growing up. I uh, when I was a young kid, I lived in this old trailer park, and yeah. we had a we had a neighbor that would, he was this old guy, and he'd come out on his porch, you know, whatever. Yeah. And uh, he, you know, he always told us, "Yeah, I was the voice of the original Popeye in the cartoons," yeah. you know. And I did I did all the Royal Blue Brutus, blah blah blah, and then where I was like, "Yeah, whatever." the old man okay sure you know whatever and then yeah until we saw him on the fucking news and the at the state fair signing autographs and he was on like the am northwest show or whatever i'm like oh yeah the fuck it was Papa. like if i could go back now i would have been like okay tell me some stories <laughs> Mac, max fleischer the creator of pup by his his granddaughter um is, is a lawyer and she does like you know little anniversary tributes uh to popeye for him on his oh, behalf cool. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, I remember that. it's it's not as popular today as it was <clears> back <throat> then. But oh, there's a lot of nerds Pop- who like who like Popeye. You know, yeah. I'm one of them. Do you, do you ever uh, uh, go go to the horror cons? You know, I will tell you what, my friend. I am uh, starved. These they don't have them here in Portland. Really? They have Comic Cons a lot, you know. They'll do the anime mixed in with some couple horror characters, but they have never had a horror con here. Uh, 
But you never. It's just a weird. You never go up to Seattle for Crypticon? No, I've never been. Uh, never been up there. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I have convention stories that would make the hairs on the back of your head stand up. I'll tell you, when when I was a kid, my parents never took me to cons because they weren't horror fans, except for the Universal Monster stuff, and I had to wait until adulthood. And it wasn't until I came back from my car crash in 2015 that I started going to them in 2016, and I was hooked for a while. And then, uh, you know, when the pandemic hit and I started getting more and more interviews, I started learning about the bullshit that happens behind the scenes them, and I started seeing a little bit of that um, the last year leading up to the pandemic, and I'm just, like, turned off of them now. But I have a lot of great stories about people I've met. You know? Yeah, I bet, especially there, that, they're, you know, kind of uh, all in one area, you know what I mean? You could you could talk to a lot of people on that day and get a lot of cool stories. Yeah, I mean, let's see, the best uh, people I've met at cons are like E.G. Daly, uh, Christy McNichol, Terry Kaiser, Pee Wee Herman, wow. Robert England. They were all great. Worst is like Linda Blair, Candy Clark, Lisa Wilcox, uh, Daniel. What was with... Uh... Linda Blair? Oh, she's a twat, I'll tell you. Oh, okay. just not very nice. She does, okay, so she does cons because she wants to raise money for her uh, animal rights charity, right? Now, she has so much PTSD from The Exorcist and stuff, I don't even know why she just doesn't stay home and sign autographs through the mail because she is just, oh my God. So me and my buddy, we're in line, and it's a long, long line, right? And the security guards came over to us asking us what our motivation was for meeting her. And I was like, oh, we just want to, we're just fans, we want to meet her, right? And they were like, oh, okay. And, and then it wasn't until later I realized maybe she's got a lot of pro-meat-eating people coming to her saying, fuck you and your animal rights, you know? <laughs> Is she, is she a big uh, animal rights activist? Huge, huge. Oh. So, so we go over to her, and I, we just want a picture with her, right? And we paid for it. It was like 40 bucks or whatever. And she just had this airs about her of like it was an inconvenience to her. And she didn't even like introduce, our, introduce herself or shake our hand. And um, I, I had the same experience with Holly Marie Combs a couple years later. It's like when they uh, when you take pictures with them, they don't fucking want to meet you. But when you're getting the autograph, then they talk to you, you know, for however right. long. And so I was just tainted by that experience of meeting her, you know. And I got a little bit of arrogance from Danielle Harris. Uh, I didn't get anything from Christy Swanson. She's a, a twat. And uh, Tara Reed uh, is very unsocial. And I met Elvira a couple of months ago. That was not a good experience either. Oh, no. no. Yeah. yeah, I never met your heroes. <laughs> you never met her? No, no. Yeah, well, okay, so uh, it gets announced that she's going to do the con, and there's going to be a plexiglass because of COVID. And I wasn't. I, I. I didn't care about that. That was fine to me. You know. I understand uh, the whole COVID thing, but they, she had two handlers with her. One who was like a woman in her early sixties, and one uh, who was in her early to mid twenties. And they. They just was just very militant and cunty. And then when I go over to meet her. I, I start telling her about the mutual friends we have, you know, and she's got this smile on her face, and then she just, like, turns and she signals uh, her, one of her handlers to get rid of me, and then I look down, and I'm like, how come she's not signing my book I just bought for 80 bucks? So I was like, hey, you're going to sign my book? And she's like, oh, yes, okay, this is yours? I didn't know, I'm sorry, and just... It was just wow. it was just really fucking oh, you awesome. Spent 80 bucks? <laughs> yeah, 80, huh. 80 bucks for that book. And then I talked to people I know who work there, uh, both <laughs> at their own table or behind the scenes, and they were saying, Yeah, she is a diva, big time. And like uh, my my friend Miss Misery, who I mentioned earlier, the horror host, she has known her for twenty years and she was not allowed to come talk to her. Oh wow. Yeah. 
And then I see her a couple weeks later uh, posting some con video where she's like, you know, hugging people uh, without no pet plexiglass and being so nice. I was like, what the fuck was like, what was her beef with Sacramento, you know? <laughs> right. That was weird. That was totally weird, man. I don't know. I have a great story. Yeah, you got s- Go ahead. some people you catch it on. Some people you catch on a bad day, you know. And then some people just are that way all the time. I, I don't think that was a bad day. That was obviously some premeditated thing, <laughs> you know. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I mean, some people have told me bad things about her, and of course, I know a lot of people in the in- industry who defend her, which is bullshit to me. That's just another uh, sophisticated form of gaslighting, I think. Hmm. But. I have a great story about meeting Ari Lehman. All right. All right, so I'm at his table. He is next door to Kane Hodder, and Kane has a huge line that's like all the way out the door into the parking lot. Huge. And yet, Kane is fucking with Ari during all the signings. I mean, he's going over to him and just tickling his sides or doing something weird like that. And so it's my turn, and so Ari's signing my DVD cover, and Kane comes up and pinches his elbow. And Ari smears his uh, his his name <laughs> all, <laughs> all over my uh, my DVD cover. And I, I see it, and I look at Kane, and Kane's all like, what are you looking at? <laughs> <laughs> And I say to I say to Ari, and Ari's like kind of mad. He's like, "Dude, you fucked me up here. You know, look what you did to this guy's uh, DVD cover." And I said to him, "I don't I don't know if I'm going to meet Kane this weekend because his line's so long. But if I don't, I'm going to count that as his signature." <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. But then I did meet him Sunday. I was the second person in line on Sunday. And that was the first of two times I met him. I didn't bring up that experience, but um, it was it was great. <laughs> yeah, I always liked him in uh, Thirteen Fanboy. I I, I like he played himself and kind of you know a little bit of a exaggeration, but uh, that's great. The guy is just uh, I like him in all everything he does. Yeah, let's let's talk about Thirteen Fanboy because we both contributed uh, to that, you know. And Greg also was a contributor, you know. Mm-hmm. I had my experience. Greg certainly had his. What was your experience like? I had a really a great time. I did. Uh, I you know I helped a lot with the campaign. I had a lot of fun during the campaign. It was my first uh, voice work, and now I have like. Well, I have many, many, many credits now for voice work, and uh, mm-hmm. became friends with Deborah, and uh, you know a lot of other people. Man, I, I I met a lot of people that I still talk to daily uh, through and because of that campaign mm-hmm. and, and website and everything. So, I personally had a really good time. Um, I know there's mixed reviews for other people, but I. I I loved it. I, I have nothing but fantastic memories from it. I met some of the greatest people in my life from it, and just uh, you know, given the opportunity to do my first voice work, which was even shown theatrically. Theatrically, so uh, that was fucking awesome. And mm. then uh, you know, I got to be in a movie with tons of my favorite Friday the Thirteenth alumni. So yeah, yeah, it's pretty much. Uh, all uh, all stars for me. Yeah, I was a big supporter of the project at first, and then shit started getting weird, and they lost me. I started seeing you know people dropping out like Adrian and Tom Matthews. Then tons of people kept getting added on as producers and cast members, and I was like, "What the fuck is going on? Like, how is this, how is this going to be executed?" That they keep adding all these people, you know. And then you know my experience was chicken shit compared to Greg's. You know, I mean, he genuinely got bullied, and that was horrible. I was just like, you know, what the fuck are we still in? high school you know but i my experience was this i auditioned for the movie and i did a very funny rendition of the sheriff in part five you know going ape shit on jason's killing oh right 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 yeah right. yeah and i i thought i thought it was very funny i knew i wasn't gonna get it right but i just 
I, I felt I felt that Deborah didn't give me a, a proper thank you. She sent me like a a corporate email on behalf of everyone thanking me, you know. But the whole thing is, I wanted to make Deborah laugh, you know, because she had been on the show a couple times up to that point, and just you know that was that was what what tainted it for me. But you know, I had her back on to promote it, and I had Judy Ernson on around that time, and a couple other people to promote it, you know. But I just wish that you know I could have gotten a, a proper thank you. But um, I like the movie. I think Laura and Tracy both did a fantastic job, especially Tracy's, considering she hadn't acted in over forty years, you know, by that point. Yeah, yeah. I think they were both fantastic in their respective roles. And I got to, and during the experience, I got to know awesome people like Noelle and, and Lisa Perez, who have who have been on the show. I'm the only, I'm the yeah, only. Yeah, yeah, you know. Uh huh. Go ahead. Yeah, both of them. Uh, yeah, great, great people. Those are some of the friends I was talking about that I met kind of through this campaign, and I'm still friends yeah. with to this day. Yeah, uh, Lisa, I'm, I'm the only uh, one who, uh, whose podcast she'll do. Uh, we 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 have you know DMs at two a.m. that would get us canceled. I mean, dirty. <laughs> yeah, she's DMs. hilarious. Yeah. Oh God, just graphic graphic stuff, and I just adore her. And hey, I know yeah, Noelia, I, I had her on around Halloween time, and we had a blast. I I, I don't think she expected me to have such a dirty mouth, but we had a blast. <laughs> <laughs> and she told me that her, Lisa, and another girl shared a bed together. <laughs> Probably uh, 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 Christine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know Christine, but, like, yeah, the three of them had to share a room and a bed. <laughs> but, yeah, that, I mean, I, I'm glad I got my name in the credits, at least, you know. It's just, the whole the whole thing with Greg, you know, that was just so unfortunate, you know, and I hope, I hope as time goes on, he still continues getting you know some sort of closure, and and everything about that. But, yeah, last time I talked to him, he I think he said he had actually had discussions with a few people and kind of uh, you know mended some fences. Uh, there was a few that uh, he, you know, that may never happen. Yeah, but I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that it's uh, you know he's coming along there. He's a he's a funny dude. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah, he he was the first podcast that was ever on Python's Paradise, and mm-hmm. the one thing I, I really enjoyed about his his podcast was, like I was saying earlier, it's the the weird little things. Like, you know, like most of the time there'll be like a podcast, you know, and someone will be like, oh, here's uh, here's Tom Cruise and uh, fucking you know whatever the other guy from the movie, and then you know along will come Greg, and he's like, hey the guy that worked in the back on that other thing, you know, what, what was your experience like on set? You know, and it was like, and me, me being, you know, uh, doing some acting, some voice acting and a bunch of featured background acting. uh, I'm kind of in that position of the people that he's asking, you know, so it's neat to hear just like, and it's so strange too. like, uh, well, this topic, for instance, uh, Mm -hmm. You know, you got you got three people with three different experiences from it. You know, we all walked away with kind of a different experience, and uh, you know, it's, I, I'm kind of sad that everybody didn't have the experience that I had because I, I, it was just absolutely wonderful. I made tons of friends. I had the best time ever. I enjoyed everything from the beginning to the end. Um, you know, at, at the end when things kind of fell apart and unraveled, and people started you know, going at each other for a while and there was this big confusion and what's going on. Uh, that was a little crazy, but no, I, uh, yeah, I, I really, uh, really had a fantastic deal with that one. That was kind of my, my kickoff into the, into the field. Mostly. I think since then I've done tons and tons of work before that, you know, I, like I said, I've always been a movie person and I, I was just like, uh, you know, I, I, I just wanted to do, uh, be an extra in one movie so I could, point out to my grandkids when I pause the movie see that guy back there with the dog in the park <laughs> that's me you know and I just thought that'd be cool and then it just kind of accidentally went going more and more from there but I I'm shooting a movie my friend I'm getting ready to put together everything for some sort of fucking funding 
Uh, I've got I've got vehicles. I've got locations. I've got actors. I've got props. I've got fucking cameraman. I've got fucking sound guy. I've got a lighting person. And I've already written the story, got the script. And we're kind of finalizing some of the stuff right now. And then we're going to go over the shooting script. And then we're going to shoot it. I'm hoping to start somewhere around March. And, uh, nice. yeah. Be yeah. my first... Uh, First one myself. I you know I it's funny I started listening to Greg's show five months before I started my own uh, because I was going to meet uh, Adrian and Lisa Wilcox at a convention and I wanted to hear some interviews to, just to hear how nice of people uh, they are and stuff and I, I listened to Greg's uh, show and it's funny uh, the first one was Adrian's and that was his second one ever and he had a co-host at that time who he calls dipshit, and the guy was a dipshit if you go listen to those early shows. And even though uh, the guy was the guy that was with him was a dipshit, Greg grew on me, so I started listening to his show more and more. And then when I started my podcast, uh, we just started following each other. And we've always helped each other get guests. There was a period where, where we were mad at each other, but uh, this experience with 13 Fanboy... Uh, with the the drama brought us back together, you know, and I, I thank him for a lot. He's 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 gotten me connected with, with with so many people, and I've gotten him connected with so many people. It's like who knew, you know, s- seven years ago, who knew? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, for real. Now I heard you say on uh, one of Greg's episodes that uh, you grew up loving Benny Hill and Monty Python. Benny Hill is my my favorite uh, all time, all time. Yeah, same uh, here. And yeah, of course, Monty Python. I've, I've always been a fan of kind of dad. I'm a Walking Dad joke. I mean, that's just yeah. I love that kind of thing. That uh, that dry humor. I've always loved it. Benny Hill to me, it will always be the greatest, the, the greatest of all time. I mean. You can't do what Benny did anymore. He, he'd be canceled today for sure. But uh, just that humor, the, the funny, the skits, the uh, the endless dad jokes over and over and over. And uh, I don't know. He was a he was a true master at it and did it at a high level for a long, long time. And uh, yeah, I was sad when that show ended. I still watch it on YouTube as much as I can while I can. Yeah, I oh my god! Do you remember like uh, back in the eighties? You go to the video store and you see all these uh, Benny Hill uh, shows on Thorn and My Video. Yeah, I have one yep. of them so far. I haven't found too many good deals on them on eBay, but I found one um, about four years ago, four or five years ago that I have. I want to get more because those are just. Uh, Thor and M.I. was revolutionary in home video, and I owned so many of their of their VHS tapes from all their divisions. Uh, Thor and M.I. HBO Video, HBO Canon Video, HBO Video. It's just it was a groundbreaking revolution, and it was like early technology in home video that they that they were at the forefront of. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there was so many so many. Uh like VHS directly related uh, intros, you know, when you'd see like the uh, the logo oh, yeah. or the, the, the music on the intros, you know, and then so many of those companies are not even anymore. Yeah, it's, it's sad, but they, uh, they live on, uh, they still, I mean, the videos still exist. They'll be extinct soon, but they still exist. And, you know, you got YouTube to see it. Uh, yeah. Uh, Betty Hill was on HBO uh, like in the early 80s and probably UHF stations no matter, you know, depending on where you lived and stuff, but Monty Python was mo- mostly PBS Yeah, yeah that, our Channel 10, yeah, that and uh, uh, Balti Towers and Black Adder Are you being served? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, I always uh, that's that's my kind of humor Mr. Mr. Bean was on HBO when I was a kid, and then he went, oh god yes, and then he went to uh, PBS after a while. Yeah, I loved all of those shows, but I love uh, but, me some Mr. Bean. 
But Benny Hill, I mean, he was on for over 20 years. And, you know, it's, it's funny, he only did like 100 episodes. And, you know, uh, syndication would like cut them up into half hour episodes so there would be more, you know? Right, right. Or that, Cash them out. Which is a pretty clever marketing ploy. But I remember there was, there was one sketch where he's a leather biker and he's having a brawl with all these strippers at a strip bar. He's like bouncing their boobs and uh, the 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 boys are back in town is playing <laughs> in the background, you know, from Thin Lizzy. <laughs> right, right. Or there's one where he's got a remote control and he's like, you know, muting people and fast forwarding them. I was like, okay, this is where Ab Sandler got the idea for click. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it is, it is classic, classic. So, uh, you, yeah, you've mentioned before about uh, certain uh, indie horror stuff that you got coming up and stuff, but uh, is there is there any others that you could mention? Um, well, there's a uh, uh, fur, mm-hmm. Josh Graves, uh, he's doing one, and... Uh, Let's see what else. Well, we got Springsville. I think uh, I think Les is doing a full version of that. Uh, I'm trying to think. I'm just all of a sudden drawing a blank, but I got a bunch of a bunch of stuff. That's that's what's weird about doing like all this stuff. Ever since I started doing this, I, I it's all a waiting game. Mm-hmm. It's like I did stuff two or three years ago that I haven't seen. You know, <laughs> so, <laughs> I guess someday I will. I don't know, but <clears throat> so yeah, I don't know. It's weird, but. Uh, Got some of the uh, uh, Sean C. Phillips films coming out. Uh, what's the uh, Pay to Die is one of them, I think. James Balsamo and I have been working together. He said he's got a role. He's writing for me, so mm-hmm. uh, I think I'm going to go down to California maybe this summer. I had him on uh, a couple months ago. It, it was a it was a strange interview. People have been commenting like, "Why the fuck is he being a dick to you?" <laughs> you know, <laughs> I was like, "He's a really funny guy." I was like, "I guess that's him." You know, I mean, I met him at a con last summer after being Facebook friends for like five years. You know, but yeah, I was like, "Whatever." You know, you know, even Greg told me that he's like, "No, he's he's a strange guy." <laughs> you know, just like a lot of those indie filmmakers. Yep, eccentric. Eccentric, yes, <clears throat> exactly. Uh, Greg, Greg has a question for you. I, is your belly button in any or an Audi? <laughs> well, I'm, uh, I'm still in, still in any, but it's uh, I put enough, I keep enough lint in there that it just you know it flushes off. <laughs> yeah, uh, Greg knows I ask women that question, so that's why he he wanted me to ask oh, you that. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Most of the uh, women in the uh, in the Friday franchise are innies, although Lauren Marie, she's like any Audi, and she hates belly buttons. She told me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Troy, I, I thank you for doing this today, man. And you know, I'll see you on Facebook, and you know, keep doing the indie horror thing, you know, as long as you can, and have a happy new year, and be safe out there. Well, thanks for having me. I really do appreciate it. This has been a very fun chat, and uh, maybe we'll do it again sometime. And you as well. Have a wonderful year, and uh, good luck on all of your future interviews. Absolutely, sir. Thank you so much. All right, man. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, there you have it. Troy Elke, ain't he a cool dude? Ah, what a cool, nice guy, huh? Yeah, he's he's definitely cut from another kind of cloth, like Greg said, and uh, he's a funny guy, and I'm so glad that uh, we could have this talk today. And, you know, despite, you know, a little bit of negativity I had, you know, it, it was a great conversation, you know. He obviously had a great time, and I'm glad we could do it. I'm still bummed out about Cindy Morgan. God, that's so sad. 69 years old, you know, 69. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Liar, dudes!